Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 113 of the All Dolphins podcast. Today is Behind Enemy Lines, where you see we are joined by a good friend, Joshua Briscoe, here. We'll get to Joshua in a really quick second, uh, as we always do, recognizing the player for the jersey number of the episode 13. Obviously, there are two players who wore 13 for the Dolphins, Dan Marino. Oh, what a surprise who this is going to be. Jake Scott. How about that? Part of the greatest uh, safety tandem in Dolphin history. Yes, I said it. Dan Marino is obviously the best player to wear 13, but he's so obvious. So we'll go Jake Scott, who partnered with Dick Anderson on the Super Bowl teams of the 1970s, came from the, played in the CFL before he played for the Dolphins, was traded because he had a falling out with Don Shula in 1975. I want to say traded to Washington, but that dude could play. Uh, may, may have been the most talented player on that perfect season defense. Really? Most okay. Talented. Full transparency here. I have an issue with all of the 72 guys because I don't acknowledge them for the greatness that they were. Um, and so on a trip to London, uh, and this is, this is, this is on a trip to London. I happened to be on the plane with a lot of dolphins people. And one of those elite safeties, I can never remember which one. It was, Dick, it was Dick Anderson because Jake Scott was out of circulation for many, many years. So it okay. was Dick Anderson. So it was Dick Anderson. And he just kept telling me how great he was and how how I got to put more respect on the 72 team and his name. And he's like, oh, I got all these records and I did all this. And I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, guy, I was born in 77. Give me a break. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Well, Omar, he was NFL Defensive Player of the Year four years before you were born in 1973. Yeah. With that, he was, his mind was blown how I didn't know him and how I didn't. I still can't even remember which one it is. Like, Dick and I apologize. Dick I apologize, Anderson. Dick Anderson. Okay. I'm going to do some homework on Dick Anderson so I can come back and give a, a, a book report. Careful Fair how you enough. Google that. There, there you go, Google. There you go. Uh, our good friend Joshua is here. Joshua Briscoe covers the Chiefs. I have to look at my phone because Joshua does 17 million things, so I don't want to leave anything out. He's a hustler. I respect hustlers. He's a grinder. I prefer the term grinder. Co-host of The Zone, host of Chiefs Post Game on Sports Radio 810, uh, only weird games on the KC Sports Network, and publisher of Arrowhead Report on Sports Illustrated Fan Nation sister site, uh, Arrowhead Report. Of course, we're all Dolphins on the fan network. Joshua, how are you, my friend? I'm great. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. I just cannot believe I'm talking to you guys after the Chiefs lost to the Broncos. It hasn't happened in eight years, so you can't you can't be too mad at me for thinking that wasn't going to happen. But uh, yeah, it's a weird time of year here in Kansas City, and I think we're all looking forward to what the the, the game that's been circling the calendar for the longest is this hey, one that we're shipping off. Well, it hasn't been circled. Did you guys oh. circle it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, even just trying to get through the math of what the Germany game was going to be, it was like, all right, well, they can ship the, the Bears out there so you can have the Tyreek Hill return at Arrowhead and it ends up being in Germany, which I think the Chiefs are just fine with, to be fair. But no, this this is, I think, the most fun game on the schedule for the Chiefs. They've, they've had their issues and, and their, their matchups with the Bengals and obviously the Eagles and the Bills, but this is the new one, so it's the one that I think we've talked about the most. Is it possible? And it's funny, too, because before the Dolphins played the Eagles, the Eagles lost against the Jets. So I asked my good buddy Ed, Ed Kratz, is it possible that the Eagles overlooked the Jets looking ahead to the Dolphin matchup? Is it possible the Chiefs overlooked or looked past the Broncos yesterday to the Dolphins matchup? Yeah, I'm not usually a big believer in like the trap game because that kind of means that you have to be like the animal walking through the forest that steps in a trap. I'm like, oh man, I can't believe I'm a bear that didn't realize there was a big metal trap on the ground. Uh, but also listening to them talk post game is kind of what it sounded like. I mean, Mahomes had the flu, but Justin Reed, the safety, talked about the defense being kind of on their heels a little bit. And that game was not the defense's fault, to be clear. But Andy Reid talked about, you know, just not the, the Broncos didn't do anything different than they did when they played two weeks earlier. So, yeah, I mean, if, if it was bad energy, kind of like it was in week one, if it was not having much to add to the game plan and maybe they're tinkering and saving the good stuff for Miami, I, I don't know. But it. I, I think it's fair to actually say, yeah, that that was a bit of a trap game, and they had their worst day at the office of the year. Hold on, Josh. Uh, so are you telling me that you don't factor in the division opponent and familiarity? And because I mean, it doesn't matter how how 
what the caliber is of the AFC East opponent. I can tell you anybody could get anybody in this division. Is 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 AFC West just not the same way? No, I, I do think you'd have to take that into account, but we also have to take into account that I believe Barack Obama was president the last time the Broncos beat the Chiefs. So, I mean, like that part, the AFC West for three teams is wide open, just throwing punches, haymakers left and right. And the Chiefs have not been that. This loss to the Broncos was Patrick Mahomes' first road loss in the AFC West. That And a shocking stat that does not seem right. He's been playing football here for a minute now. His first loss to the Broncos and his first loss on the road in the AFC West. Yeah, and what was it, like 15 straight they had won against the AFC 16. West? Nobody 16. Nobody hit The 72 Dolphins would have been talking bleep if they would have if they would have been playing just one consistent season. 16 and 0. <laughs> they never lost a game on the road in the AFC West. First one happened happened dude, on they, Sunday. Dude, they've won the division what, like seven years in a row. I mean, they they completely own that division. It's crazy. That's why I have no offense, Joshua. Have a little bit of Chiefs fatigue syndrome, sure. which which flares up every once in a while. It flares up when the official don't make a blatant DPI call. Uh, I don't know. It was Trent McDuffie at the end of the Minnesota game, like where it seems like every close call goes their way. That's a different topic. Um, we were doing the, the, our post game recap on the all dolphins podcast yesterday. And I was, I was paying attention to Omar as I always do What, Omar, are you there? Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, and with an eye also on the, the, the red zone network. And every time I was looking up and they would show the chiefs to me, it looked like it was Patrick Mahomes running around in the backfield. Look, trying to escape pressure, looking for somebody to throw to. I mean, it was like bad. Yeah, that it, so I I haven't gotten to see the all twenty two yet as we do this now, and so I I am really really interested to see what was happening downfield. But so my little caveat here, and I'm I'm doing the post game show for eight ten like you mentioned, so I'm watching the game and then we go live like much like you guys I'm sure doing the post game, and it's like all right we, we got to start talking about what we think we saw, but you guys know that you got twenty two dudes on the field at any given point, a lot of stuff is happening. So it's it's genuinely difficult to be like a hundred percent like I'm going to be definitive because I think being definitive about a game you've only seen a third of the field for is a good way to sound like a fool pretty quickly, right? But here's what I can say. never stopped anybody before. No, and that's and that's fair. That's fair. I feel like we're in we're in polite, foolish company. But watching Patrick Mahomes, which we can do every play, he he just he 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 looks like he has lost faith or maybe never found faith in a whole bunch of these pass catchers who don't wear number 87. Rasheed Rice is a rookie. Rookies never do anything in Andy Reid's offense, nothing substantial. He's their best wide receiver right now by a country mile. It's, it's not close. And Mahomes is learning that. And I think trusting that Rasheed Rice had a bad drop as well. But Sky Moore has not taken any steps and, and has not earned any trust. Marquez Valdez Scantling in his sixth year yesterday, Mahomes threw a pass to him. And, and from behind, the DB broke it up. Can't remember who it was, but knocked the ball out. And afterwards, the camera cuts to Mahomes and he's waving back to his face, telling him to come back to the football. When that happens to a rookie, it's like, come on, Rook, like, pay attention. You know, this is what Mahomes wants. When it happens to a six-year vet who's in his second year with the offense, it's, like, legitimately concerning. So I don't think the offensive line had a great game by any means yesterday. Um, I'll be very curious again, though, to see, was Mahomes seeing Sky Moore get open and then just saying, I don't trust him. I'm going to wait for, for Kelsey. And then all of a sudden, it, it all comes crumbling down. Or did he just not have options downfield? It, it, it seems to me like the, the best chance is there's a little bit of both there happening on Sunday. I, I, I do have a tremendous amount of interest in Kadarius Tony. Uh, he's a yeah. Florida kid that I've never been a fan of. And I just wondered how did Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs get catfished for Tony? <laughs> I, I really want to know because that guy can't catch. Well, they they ended up having him play a pretty large role in his little gadget packages on the way to the Super Bowl last year, which is going to be the thing Chiefs fans say forever is, hey, do you win the Super Bowl without him? I don't know. I don't love that line of thinking because, like, the real truth is that Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Chris Jones, in that order, like, those are the three guys who matter, matter. But regardless, I think other guys could have made some of those plays. I think I think I've been texting the catfish too, Omar. I really do. Like, I, I keep waiting. I keep thinking, well, maybe... Maybe this is going to be something because, I don't know, I, you guys may not be familiar. There was a receiver here named Tyreek Hill for a long time. And, hold on, yeah. hold on. Doesn't he go by the name of uh, Tiger or Puma or something? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, the leopard, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the leopard. Um, And so, like, 
really, in all seriousness, that that explosiveness and that burst has has been a game the Chiefs have been trying to chase, and they knew they weren't going to get Tyree Kill. But like, I understand why they saw the skill set of Kadarius Tony and thought there's there's more to unpack here. And we saw glimpses of it last year, but even last year, the the logic was, hey, he can do some stuff for us in 2022, but this is really a move for 2023. And 2023 is here, and unfortunately, the biggest impact he's had this year was letting the ball go through his hands uh, a bunch of times against the Lions in week one in a game when they really needed him. So he was, the, I believe, the lowest snapped wide receiver for the Chiefs yesterday for the first time this year, uh, partially because Justin Ross didn't play. So, um, But but he, he had the fewest reps at, at wide receiver, and at this point, even as someone who is so enticed by his skill set, I wonder, I wonder if the Chiefs have anything left to offer there. Here, here's a word question for you, especially in light of the fact that the Chiefs did win the Super Bowl last year. If they had a do-over, is there any way in hell they reconsider and give Tyreek the money he wants and not make that trade with the Dolphins? I was hoping you'd ask that, and, and it's, it's because it's fascinating that I could 100% make an argument to either side of it because the offense is missing not just something. This offense is missing Tyreek Hill, and it's really missing a number one wide receiver in a bunch of ways. But the offense was was pretty darn good last year with Juju Smith-Schuster. They're, they're also missing him. The defense right now is by far the best defense Patrick Mahomes has had with the Kansas City Chiefs. It's not even close. It's a legitimate top five unit. And I say that just as confidently after the Broncos game. Every drive, I'll see if I got the numbers off the top of my head, the touchdown drives for the Broncos were 50 yards, 39 yards, and 10 yards. This is not the defense's fault. But to, anyway, to your actual question, I wonder if they'd think about it also in part because trading Tyreek Hill was was partially because you could only pay Tyreek Hill or Chris Jones. And this entire offseason, that Chris Jones saga was a mess. And he ends up playing on what is very, very similar to the same one year he had left on his original contract. So if if they could go back and trade Chris Jones and, and keep Tyreek Hill and pay him, I wonder if they would think about it. But the defense is so good right now. And the pieces they got in return for Hill have been pretty good. Uh, but I, I do wonder very, very frequently, I wonder what Brett Veach thinks when he's, you know, staring at a ceiling late at night thinking, man, I, I wish this team had a number one wide receiver. Yeah. I, and let me follow up on this, Joshua, because I'm looking at this from an outsider's perspective and, you know, understand that I've spent most of my career talking to executives and GMs who are basically like, we got to find another Tyreek. We got to find, we got to find this next Tyreek. And then here the Chiefs are, the team that actually has Tyreek and actually has the next generation wide receiver, um, the the biggest wep- biggest and baddest weapon in the NFL. And they say, you know what? Ah, we can't really afford him. We're going to give him away. Um, did Tyreek somehow wear out his welcome, Andy Reid? Because I see he's growing a, 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 I don't even know what they call that Two thing now. Two man shoe. Two man shoe. And I yeah, think that's it's to mock Andy. I think it's he's been growing it for a month, and I think it's to mock Andy Reid. Like, did he for this? For, and he said he he got his hair cut back Kansas City style, no more dreads, Ooh. you know, at throwback. And he wants you to remember what he once was. So Fu Manchu, Kansas City throwback, blonde, you know, t- colored top. Did he wear out his welcome in Kansas City? He talks about the Chiefs a lot still, doesn't he? Like I don't yeah. I don't even think it's like bitter. I don't I don't mean that to be dismissive, but he talks about the X a lot. I yeah. I don't think I don't think he wore out his welcome. I I think he The funny thing is with all the talking about the Chiefs he's done and the stuff about how Tua throws the best football and, and that he's ever caught and whatever from last year. Yeah, one thing that I did on that one. It, well, I mean, it's also a crazy thing for him to say, but like, we're just all being honest. It's a crazy take, but it's fine. He can say it. It's his current quarterback. Hey, so I didn't blame him for saying that. In the NFL right now. Yeah. And that's definitely, that's definitely the end of the conversation for sure. Uh, I'm sure you guys have handled it just that simply the whole time. <laughs> oh my but, God. I'm sorry. What? I, I look, man, I, I don't want to anon involved. I think he's, a, oh, I think he's, a, to a I, I think he's a fine quarterback, and I hope Dolphins. I hope I hope we get to see a rematch of this game in the AFC Championship game, ideally in Kansas City. I would love that. Um, but what was interesting to me last year is, as much as Tyreek was talking about Chief stuff and and loving Tua and feeling at home in Miami and all of that, it never wavered from especially Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and even other members of the receiving room. They all still talked about him like like a brother who they love and who they treasure the, the experience with and everything. And I don't think that's nothing like there have been there have been a couple of guys, maybe mostly defensive. So I don't know if I got a great example, but guys who have left and you don't really hear about anymore. 
they still talk about Tyreek and and seem genuinely like pretty excited for each other's success. That seems mutual. Um, so I don't think he wore out his welcome, but I do think you've seen the Dolphins treat him very differently in a public setting than the Chiefs ever did, which is also very interesting to me. Yeah, Tyreek. Uh, can, can, can you expand on that? Can you expand on that, Joshua? Yeah, I think you guys talked to Tyreek more per week than we did maybe the whole time he was here. I mean, like they, they, Tyree Kill was not a podium player in Kansas City. That's an, I'm exaggerating, but that second part is is true. He was not, he was not a midweek podium player here. We we got Anthony Hitchens and um, you know, your your sort of offensive role players. Your your Mike line, Anthony Hitchens was the Mike linebacker for uh, a couple of years. Like we got a lot more of those. A lot of Tyron Matthew on, uh, which was still good. He you know he gives a good quote, but we did not hear from Tyree Kill very often in Kansas City. That's partially because of the circumstances he entered the league under partially as all of that bubbled around again a couple of years later. Um, and partially because I just don't think Andy Reid likes having guys at the podium who he doesn't, who he thinks might say something that makes it out of the ecosystem. Uh, so we just did not, we did not Ty hear from Tyreek like that. Yeah, Ty shocking, I know, I know. say things I'm, that make it out of the ecosystem? No, no. You guys seem shocked, yeah. Yeah, he, he's got a podcast. I, you know, I didn't cover the team last year, so I'm not, I wasn't familiar or aware of Tyreek and, and the fact that he'll just say things for effect. You need so, to be said. Uh, yeah, it needs to be said. And, and and so I've become more aware that, you know, he says things for effect. Um, so I don't really take him that seriously. And I think anybody that does, you're crazy. Um, but so Andy Reid was basically scared of that. I I think, again, like kind of from the original circumstances, they wanted to try to keep that whole conversation out of the way as much as they could. And then there was, again, a kind of a whole resurfacing of some more off the field stuff a few years in. And that kind of started a whole another little firestorm. And then we just didn't hear from him for a while. Uh, so I think just by like the mandatory ways that you have to make players available to the media, we got him post game a few times. Uh, but yeah, it's a very the, the Chiefs like um, podium strategy, I would say, is is that of an organization that that wants to be buttoned up and, and professional and treated like a like an arm of, of a political office much more than it's like go out there and say something funny for the social team or whatever. Um, and, and Tyreek seems like a, like it's Miami is treating Tyreek Hill like a face of the franchise type of guy that you're going to let talk and, and let drive engagement and excitement and all of that. And he was not that guy in Kansas city. And, but he kind of took on that role by himself last year. The second he came in with some of the comments that he made and immediately with the, the massive public backing of Tua um, and he kind of put himself in that role. Uh, more specifically in, in practical matters, looking to Sunday, what's your take on, on what kind of success the chiefs can have trying to defend the dude now? It's fascinating because the chiefs have some great corners and I still don't know. Uh, Trent McDuffie has been spectacular this year. He, he was drafted last year, missed about six games early in the year with a, an injury that, that cost him the beginning of the season. He, he has been playing at an all-pro type of level. Really, really stupendous. He, he can play inside-outside, as can Legereus Sneed, who obviously is, is familiar with Tyreek Hill. Um, McDuffie never crossed over. In fact, that pick ended up being somehow connected to Tyreek. I can't remember all of the moves because the Chiefs had to move up again. But um, he's been fantastic. And so if they, 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 they put Tyreek in the slot, the Chiefs have two options who could play him there. I don't think they would have Sneed follow him outside. Uh, I don't know even how you guys measure where Tyreek Hill lines up and is usually used because there is so much of that horizontal motion pre-snap, which is fascinating because the Chiefs are obviously familiar with that. They've been running that in practice for years. That won't catch Steve Spagnuolo by surprise, but still actually covering Tyreek is going to be fascinating. So I, I think you probably want, I think, I think the Chiefs probably want to see McDuffie get the first shot at him. The, Funny thing is, the Dolphins are not one-dimensional that way. So if you say, all right, you're going to have it be McDuffie as often as you can and then get some some solid safety help from a really good secondary. Justin Reed and Brian Cook back behind there. Uh, Mike Edwards is the third safety. Really good player this year. That's all encouraging. They have the pieces. But I don't think that having the pieces means you slow down Tyreek Hill. So I, I think he's going to have a big game. I, I think that the, the Dolphins would be right to try to feed him a big game. I think he's going to be very, 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 very ready for this game. Uh, but I, I think the Chiefs defense is legitimate. I just think it's going to be a little bit of a, a back and forth. Now, I want to ask you about the defense. You you, you keep talking about Chris Jones, and I, I watch him train down here at Bomarito, and, and he's oh, – Yeah, he was there instead of a training camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a monster. He's a monster. And I, I know Bob Marito does it, does everything um phenomenally well. So he he came back in, in great shape. 
how how is it is this defense just Chris Jones or are other other guys who are who are who are scary presences? Great question. It's not just Chris Jones, which is a little bit of a new development, but it's still first and foremost with it begins with Chris Jones because what opposing offenses will do. I mean, there is an amount I haven't seen like a new one of the new uh, dot charts for the last couple of weeks. But generally speaking, if you if you're looking at like one of those one of those charts for pass rush win, win rate and double team rate, look to the top right corner and that's where Chris Jones is going to be. He's getting double teamed constantly and he's winning a ton even with that. So like yesterday, George Karloff, this made a great play. That was because the entire focus from that side of the line was on doubling Chris Jones. So he, he's, he's the straw that stirs the drink, whatever. He's the keystone. He, he's everything that begins with Chris Jones. Um, and, and so that's how the Dolphins are going to treat him, I certainly imagine. He also can go outside, especially in third down passing situations, try to mm -hmm. hunt a one-on-one -on -one matchup, which I think is going to be a big part of the game plan here. But no, but it's not just him. A defensive end and inside. Charles Aminahu just came back from a suspension. He's been very, very good, and he can play inside, outside, maybe even better on the interior. Uh, the defensive line coach, Joe, Joe Cullen, mentioned a week or two ago, uh, he invoked the Steve Spagnuolo giant Super Bowl defensive lines with just four defensive ends out there across the line. They're doing that again this year. Mike Dana can go inside, outside. George Karloftis uh, can do a little inside, outside. He's a huge, huge dude, but he's more comfortable on the edge still. Um, that that front four and the rotation they can get through with those guys is really, really fun. And I think that's a big part of why this is, is working that way also. And then I already shouted out a bunch of the defensive backs who've had really nice seasons. Um, Joshua Williams and Jalen Watson are kind of always rotating, fighting, matchup by matchup even uh, for that third cornerback spot. They're going to be on the field. They're going to have to have good games. It's a good unit all the way around. I, and the linebacker group, even without Nick Bolton, starting Mike linebacker, still fantastic as well. Drew Tranquil's been great uh, stepping in for, for Bolton so far this year. So it's a really, really talented defense. It, but Chris Jones is first and foremost. You, you know, one thing I do notice about those front-running teams um, and the Dolphins are, are working their way to become what the Chiefs are, but you're generally playing with a lead, which allows your defense to pin their ears back. Now, when they're playing a high-powered offense like the Miami Dolphins, do they can keep pace? Yeah, I, you know, I do. I, I really, I have fully kind of just doubled down on this defense pretty much every step along the way, and I have not regretted it yet. Um, I, I think that they have the depth for things like just getting fresh legs out there. And I think that, the again, specifically the secondary from a speed perspective, no one has Tyree kill speed on this defense. But in terms of standing up as well as any defense can, I, I do think the Chiefs will put up a good effort that way. Uh, do we have to talk about Taylor Swift if we're doing a Kansas City behind enemy lines or can we skip? Can we skip? I got, I got a hat over here, actually. I was going to bring this just for you guys if you want my my I'm just here for Taylor. Oh, hat. Nice. oh um, I like that. This is the funniest thing for me because, you know, surrounding circumstances. So, no, she looked she wasn't there for the Denver game and they lost. Wait, so they, they showed the graphic at the beginning of the game and we all kind of like a little tongue in cheek groaned of like they're even even when she's not here, they're putting up the stats of Tyreek with her or excuse, with, with, whoa, whoa, Frodian slip of, of, of Travis Kelsey with Taylor Swift here and Travis Kelsey without Taylor Swift. And then he didn't have as good of a game as he had when she's been around. And then we were like, okay, fine. Like CBS wins. They they win again. They put her on the screen. Kelsey had a bad game. I mean, by his standards, whatever. But uh, yeah, it's been wild and and kind of fun. But I, I do not expect to see her in Germany, unfortunately. Speaking of Germany, what are the Chiefs travel plans? The Dolphins are flew out there on Monday. What are the Chiefs travel plans? This is a great question. And I meant to have this for you. No one asked about it post game yesterday. No one asked Andy Reid about it last week. And as we are here right now, I don't know. Um, I did hear that they were making very, very clear that they were not talking about Germany in the building this last week to stay focused on the Broncos. And that didn't work. So uh, I, I am hoping to find out in the future past. People may know when those when those plans are, but the Chiefs have not the Chiefs have not said those plans as we podcast at this moment. Interesting. Yeah, kind of weird. Yeah. I was surprised too. With, with uh, Patrick Mahomes, uh, obviously he's having a upper echelon season i think he's probably the one marquee quarterback in this league that's unquestioned unrivaled uh where is there room for improvement or consistency especially when you have such a young receiving core unit or unproven receiving core unit right now right now i would say he looks a little unsettled um i and i again i don't know how much of that is directly the fault of the receivers how much of that is the fault of the offensive line and how much of that is his own fault if he needs to uh Whoa, hey, here you, how about this? Uh, I'll tell you right now, the Chiefs are traveling on Thursday, so they will make a late trip. 
um, uh, to Germany. Just found that out. There we go. Dolphins will be there all week. And Mike it's interesting. McDaniel, Mike McDaniel wanted them to have their day off in Germany. So I think that's kind of fun. And maybe the Chiefs yeah. would have if they would have beaten the Broncos. I don't know if that changed or what. I don't know if that's we're practicing on Monday now. I don't I don't know. I'm guessing they had. Yeah, those you, you don't change already, those arrangements because families are going. So they probably Good always point. plan to go on, on yeah. Thursday. So a late trip for them. But yeah, anyway, I, I think I do think it is. I think is right now it is a matter of figuring out who you actually trust and then being able to look beyond Travis Kelsey. Um, I, I think he would like to do that. Obviously, he did it last year with Juju Smith-Schuster plenty. But I, I think right now it's it's just a matter of those pieces coming together and if Mahomes is doing everything he can to bring those pieces together. Uh, if I look at the offensive line, correct me if I'm wrong, I see if there are spots to be attacked there, it would be more with Jawan Taylor and Donovan Smith at tackle than it would be the interior guys of Trey Smith, Creed Humphrey, and Joe Tooney. Am I correct? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we we all heard plenty about Juwan Taylor's penalties early in the year, and the penalties have gone away, which is what I expected. But he also hasn't looked super solid out there. And again, if if you can get Patrick Mahomes to bail the pocket early, that was a problem late against the Broncos. He had one rep where he bailed and didn't need to and ran right into the defensive end. Then he had another rep later where he ran right into Donovan Smith, which was not great for either of them. Uh, I think Donovan Smith may have gotten credit for that sack, or at least he should have. But yeah, I think I think that's probably right. It hasn't been atrocious but it, it hasn't been the upgrade they paid for, for, for Juwan Taylor. Certainly Donovan Smith's been, been about right for his, for his salary hit, you know, one year small deal for him. Is Juwan Taylor, Taylor's not been ideal. Is Taylor still cheating on the, on dropping too quickly on his pass sets or lining, up, lining, done. Up, oh, you, lining up behind the line? Okay. I thought you were talking about the other Taylor again. Oh, no, no, um, no. <laughs> I, I, that's been another fun game we have is, you know, Travis and Taylor, there we go. 87 and 74. Um, no, I, I really haven't seen it pop the last couple of weeks. I think they I think they figured out a little bit there, and it's right back to just what the rest of the league does in, in terms of tackle alignment. Um, so I actually, like yesterday might have been uh, the first time that I wasn't watching for an, an, a misalignment for Juwan Taylor. I think I finally stopped looking for it. Maybe refs have too. It, do you think that that Patrick Mahomes, I and it's, it's odd that you, I would question his game, but is a little bit too undisciplined in terms of wanting to get out the pocket and scramble and not be traditional, or is it a fine line? That's part I, of his that's part of his magic. Yeah, I, I I think it's important to make sure that never gets, you know, like taken away from him or kind of uh coached out of him or whatever. There have been times when it's been taken just because his mobility has been taken a little bit. Yeah. But no, I, I think right now it I think I think it can be a sign that things aren't going well. But I think that's usually not because Mahomes is doing something poorly. I think if you see him getting jittery and unsettled and looking around and, and, and scrambling a little more often, sometimes it's because the, the whole defense drops and that's fine. Some if if he if he takes off and doesn't pick up the first down, it's because something did not did not go according to plan. Here's here's the thing though, is as I look and the, the wide receiver issue started the first game because we we talked about it. you mentioned it. They lost that game. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a game where it was lost because of the wide receivers. Yeah. And that was the case. And Omar, they dropped about eight passes, one of which went straight into the hands of a, of a Lions player for a pick six in a game they lost by one. I don't even think that's in question. My thing is, was this like roster malpractice to leave the wide receiver core like this, not re signing Juju the year after you dumped Tyreek Hill? Um, I don't know who else they lost. Well, they, they lost Nicole Hardman and they brought him back, but I don't know if he's yeah. a good maker. Was but. that a desperate move? I I think the Hardman move made some sense, but it was certainly not a good sign that they were, you know, clearly not not happy with where the receiving group was. I think that's I think that's pretty obvious. And, and it's a good question, Alan, because I, I have wondered the same thing. We talked, we've talked, man, we talked about receivers so much this offseason. And that's the thing where it's like, come on, like the Chiefs had to know because we were all talking about it. And drafting Rasheed Rice in the second round out of SMU was a was a good pick. Everyone's happy with that, and he's on the right track. I think what happened this year is that they were betting on specifically Sky Moore and Kadarius Tony taking steps to become legitimate, not number one and number two wide receiver, not, 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 not number one and two, number two pass catchers for this offense because Travis Kelsey exists. But if they could be the number one and two receivers on this team and be two and three options behind Kelsey and, you know, put Isaiah Pacheco in there somewhere and say, hey, be the third and fourth options in this offense that we can rely on. I yeah. do think this offense would look a lot better, especially with Rasheed Rice being maybe better earlier than expected. But those guys did not take those steps. Kadarius Tony missed all of training camp because he got hurt. 
fielding punts before the first full team practice of oh, camp. Stop it. he sucks. It's uh, it's he it's a devastating. He got he got hurt and and needed surgery in like punt warm up before the first practice. Yeah. He's 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 played every game since then. Um, it, although he's been banged up plenty, which is you know unsurprising. But I, I think they put a lot of weight on on him and Sky Moore this off season, and, and neither one of them have taken a step there. It, it was malpractice of of the roster, and and you guys knew it. It's you know it's everything doesn't pan out for you. But if you look at Andy Reid's history of wide receivers, it's not so good. Yeah. And, and, and that's been the case for, for Veach also. I mean, it's it, it has not been a success story for, for the Chiefs in terms of wide receiver drafting and development. I know they were worried about Juju from an injury perspective, and that's kind of a, you know, that's been part of his career is he's a, he said himself, he's a young guy with old knees. So I understand why they don't want to give him a three-year deal. But like if the Patriots were actually interested in moving him, that's the call I would have made before I called about McCole Hardman. Mm, uh, Patriots might be interested. I mean, he, they, I don't think they have much use for him. I think he played last week for the first time in, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I think um, that might have, that might have kept him out of the rotation hurt. a little bit. Though. He'd been hurt. And yet yesterday right. he only played a few snaps. And Belichick was asked about him and gave one of his patented, brilliant, long-winded answers. We went to play everybody. We played other players. Um, this is kind of a generic question, but it needs to be asked because I think people might might ask, why is it that even, even when everybody knows Mahomes is looking for Travis Kelsey, why is it that he keeps putting up big numbers week after week after week? Because because even when Travis Kelsey is the focal point, he will still produce. That connection will still work. They just see the field differently and in a unified way that is truly incredible. So that's that's the beginning of it. And then beyond that, it's because when you do pay that level of attention to Travis Kelsey, someone else is going to come open. At some point, you guys are all going to look around and say, who is Justin Watson? <laughs> because you you may have briefly remembered him as largely a special teamer in Tampa. Well, now he's the Chiefs' best deep threat. Like, that's that's just kind of – he's got a big Rob Gronkowski uh, elbow brace on right now, too, because he dislocated his elbow a couple of weeks ago, so he looks even crazier. Um, but, but there is a weird element there where even like Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who I've mentioned, who's not been, been terribly productive this year, on a broken play last week, he ends up coming open downfield. Mahomes finds him there, and you go, okay, that's Mahomes keeping a play alive, finding something open, it, all the receivers knowing a play's never dead, and you will produce some that way. The offense isn't broken fundamentally, but the Broncos game is, I think, the worst example we've seen this year by a pretty wide margin. I think that's going to be a little bit more of an outlier. Um, so I, I think that they've they've also been good between the 20s by and large. They've had terrible red zone struggles this year. Uh, so the, the numbers are still there in, in a lot of the yardage uh, metrics and everything. Actually scoring once they get down there has been a, a big problem, though. And that's what, not even new for the Chiefs and Andy Reid, honestly. Where do you think this team needs to go from a coaching standpoint in order to get to that next level? I'm, I know it's, it's different when you're the hunted and everybody is hunting you. I it mean, is. The Dolphins will be hunting you. Uh, as opposed to most teams are hunting them, uh, the Dolphins will be hunting you. But where is the next level for Andy Reid in order to get this team to where Chiefs expect it to be? I think it's a good note that you're right. I mean, every week it's, all right, we're playing the Chiefs. And if you're the Chiefs, it's all right. It's Wednesday. And I do think <laughs> I do think that changes a little bit. Of, of it's, it's a little bit of an asymmetrical sort of focus. But the Chiefs obviously can't use that as an excuse, certainly. Um, it's an interesting question. Because the the thing that happened against the Broncos that is going to stick with me this week, the Chiefs didn't get anything easy ever. Nothing was easy in that game. That Isaiah Pacheco was running the ball pretty well. I think he got eight carries on five yards a carry. Could definitely just hand the football to him more often and let him do the thing where he stomps on the ground like he's trying to hurt it. Do that five yards at a time and give Patrick Mahomes second and five. And if it's second and eight, it's okay because otherwise it was going to be second and ten. I. I think that there is a little bit of a lack of trust that the Chiefs can win playing somewhat normal football. And so you get a lot of the trickeration kind of things in the red zone. You get a lot of the shotgun, uh, wildcat, Kadarius Tony snaps, uh, trying to convert third and one or fourth and one, just because I know how much you love Kadarius Tony. Um, that that element of it is a little bit strange because obviously it's like, Patrick, you don't want to take away Patrick Mahomes' improv and, and scrambling. You don't want to tell Andy Reid to be less creative. Like, that's not actually what I mean. But there is some element of like, hey, if if you guys just want to try to get like a three-yard carry here, can you can you do it? If, so if you just want to throw the ball four yards. And, 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 a, and, and honestly, a little bit. A little bit is the right term. 
I, I don't want them running the ball 80% of the time at all. But but is there a chance for you to just Rasheed Rice for seven? It doesn't have to be on the ground. Is, is there some easy stuff that you can get there, especially when defenses are trying to play back and say, we're going to keep everything in front of us, which has kind of been the handbook. The Chiefs won a Super Bowl against that handbook, to be clear. But like that's kind of the default for opposing defenses. And, and I think until the Chiefs make you pay for that, that's the way to do it. Uh, not necessarily asking you for a prediction, but before we let you go, do you have a feel for how the game goes? Do you feel pretty confident the Chiefs come back, bounce back and look more like the Chiefs that we know? Or are you? do you think this is a game where the Dolphins establish themselves as the new team to beat in the AFC? I tell you what, it would Whoa, be that's fascinating. It, it, I mean, but there's a chance to do it. If, if the Dolphins at, at 8.30 a.m. Central Time go out there, and if this game is 40 to 20, things will get wild here in a way they have not in a very long time, and I think deservedly so. Um, I do think they will look like themselves, though. I, I kind of I tweeted yes, uh, yesterday that like um, my my official view of the Broncos game is that it's an embarrassing loss, inexcusable mistakes. It shows a lot of the problems that the Chiefs have down at a deep level. Chiefs 30, Dolphins 27. Like that's kind of the, that's that's where I'm at. And I, you know, don't don't hold me to the prediction, but that's kind of where oh, I'm at. Is the Chiefs too late, for that. too late for that? That's fine. Then hold me to it. It's on record now. It's okay. I feel I feel all right about it. But that's kind of the funny thing is the Chiefs have flaws. They have problems that have cost them games this year. And I still think if you made me bet on where the AFC Championship game will be played, I would say I will bet on Kansas City, Missouri, because that has been a good bet for every single one of the last yeah. half decade of, 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 of postseason. So I, I think they will look more like themselves. And I think that this would not be a fun week to be at Arrowhead, not a fun week to be at practice, not a fun week to be on that plane. But I think, it, I think it will be a fun plane ride back if they do win this game and can actually say that's what Chiefs football actually looks like, not what happened in week one and, and not what happened against the Broncos. Do, do you think that that loss could be a catalyst to help you guys get the season kind of on solid footing? I know you, you've had success, but yeah, it's it's different when you're the hunted. And I think the Chiefs know that. Yeah, I, I think taking a big punch here. I mean, the last question from Mahomes' presser yesterday, somebody asked, you know, hey, how do you uh, keep this from being a domino game? And Mahomes' answer was, it won't be. And then the press conference ended <laughs> like that's kind of there's a there's a little bit of like Batman smoke bomb kind of energy going on, but they can do that all week. They have to they obviously have to show that actually on the field in Germany. Um, I, I think I think there will be some element of that that's a, a little bit vulcanizing or whatever that uh, ultimately solidifies them getting back in the right headspace. But it also makes this game a lot riskier because if, if they had one loss and the Dolphins got them in Germany by a field goal, you could say, you know, that's a great team, and and we're just chugging along, still the number one seed in the AFC with the tiebreakers. Yeah. That will not be the case if they lose to the Dolphins. Yeah, no, do, you, then, we, do you look at this as a game that could ultimately decide who hosts the AFC championship game? Oh, huge chance for that, yeah. I mean, the Chiefs have the Chiefs have a tiebreaker over the Jags already, who are sneaky up there with two losses. Um, but, well, listen, you can, you can wave it off. They're is, there. They're there. there. Yeah, there's, I don't know what it, I don't know what to tell you. There's uh, six the standings and the standings. have a prep schedule left, and I know you don't buy the schedule, but they play in the AFC South, Omar. Come on, man. Yeah, the, the AFC South is good. It, it's terrible when they play anyone except for the Chiefs, and they always get, like, two wins against them, it feels like, most years. But, yeah, I I, I do think this game ends up being huge for that, uh, but I, I – the Chiefs have plenty of chances to stub their toe the rest of the way. The Dolphins have plenty of chances to stub their toe the rest of the way. So it's a long season. It feels like we're both about uh, maybe week. It feels like we're about week three in some ways, and it feels like week 15 and others. And I guess that's probably what you want at about the uh, the midseason point. No, I mean, Omar, Omar, you were kind of like raise your eyebrows when I said if the Dolphins win this game, they're, they're establishing themselves as a team to beat in the AFC. They will at worst be tied for the worst record in the conference and have just beaten the team – that went to the Super Bowl last year, so I don't know what more of a of a stamp or validation. No, no, no. I, I look at the Dolphins. I think they'll. I think the Dolphins are a twelve win team, talent wise. As long as they don't start getting depleted at the offensive line and Teron Armstead comes back, there's a lot of reinforcements coming. So I believe in this Dolphins team. Um, the, what my concern is, uh, can they? You know, and I don't want to say can they beat those elite teams. And I think this is a good matchup. That's a better matchup for them than Buffalo and than Philadelphia. Yeah, there's Chris Jones and then who? You, you understand what I'm saying? So we just told I, you, Mike Dana, George Carlaftis, uh, Charles Amina, who's going to cause some problems. Charles Amina, who? Thank you. It's not just Chris Jones uh, against this offensive line. Yeah, sure, okay, 
but let let Teron Armstead come back. We got a different story here. I'm, you can't I'm, talk I'm, about the rematch before this game's happened, man. I mean, you're already you chalking this up as a loss. That's, no, no, that's no Teron Armstead's probably coming back this week. Oh, fantastic! Okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I was like, well, I don't Joshua, know that. Now I was like, neither did Joshua, I. Yeah, Joshua. Just for, so we established the facts correctly. He is eligible to return from IR this week. Okay. He's coming back. The first step is going to be he's going to be designated to return, practice, and then see how the week works. To suggest on the, on Monday, he's definitely playing Sunday. I think it may be a little bit of a stretch. But Omar, I hope you're right. But I think it's you're making it sound like it's a done deal. Connor Williams coming back. Toronto Arm says coming back. Let's write it down. There you go. We've heard it here first. Long hey, Jalen Ramsey's way. back. That actually did happen. So that yeah, was fresh. Yeah. yeah. Say, Teron Armstead saw what Jalen Ramsey did. He says, I'm duplicating it. Does that mean he Bring back that safety from earlier that you hate, too. That old guy from the 72 Dolphins whose name I've already forgotten. Oh, Dick uh, something. <laughs> Dick Anderson. <laughs> Bring back Dick I Anderson. I it, too. <laughs> there you go. Leave it to me to come up with the old names. <laughs> All right. I think on that note, we were start, we, we're starting to like go off the rails there. On that note, I think we're going to wrap it up. Joshua, thank you very, very much for the inside, the fun times, the great conversation we just had. Uh, we will be back here tomorrow, Wednesday, where it's going to be the first practice. And we will know whether Teron Armstead has been designated to return, among other things that we will discuss. He's coming back. Okay, there you go. Well, we'll just <laughs> confirm it. We'll confirm it. It won't be a revelation, but we'll confirm it. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys, everybody, tomorrow. Visit alldolphins.com for the latest news, analysis, and columns, and it's all free. You can find Omar Kelly and Alan Poupard on the All Dolphins podcast discussing South Florida's NFL team on YouTube and anywhere you find your audio podcasts. Make sure you subscribe, like, and share so you stay in the know.